Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome back to Therapist Theater. My name is Josh Treese, and I'm coming to you from Music City, USA, with the podcast that takes a look at relationships and mental health through the lens of movies, TV, and pop culture. This week's guest is Kelly Burke. Kelly is a therapist in Franklin, Tennessee, who specializes in helping couples looking to improve their relationship. She's also another emotionally focused therapy specialist and helps train other therapists looking to use that model to help their clients. For the second week in a row, our conversation is about a movie that slipped past me when it was originally released. Kelly chose 2013's About Time. Let me stop everything right now and say this. If you haven't seen this movie yet, go to Netflix, find it, and hit play. It is phenomenal. Maybe one of my top five favorite movies of all time now. Speaking of which, it's about time we get this week's show started. So let's dim the lights, raise the curtain, and start the previews. Welcome to the theater. Um, Kelly, welcome to the show. Thank, Thank you. you so much for having me uh, come to visit your incredibly fabulous space. So you have to like describe it now. Oh my goodness! So I don't I don't know how many people have visited the Middle Tennessee area, but if you've ever been to Franklin, Tennessee, it's like picture a postcard <laughs> and a, a beautiful kind of small-ish town yeah. kind of thing in the postcard. Yeah. So that's Franklin. That puts us on a map, and then. There is in a lot of small towns a main kind of thorough way, right? You know, so it's right off of that. And then picture a bakery <laughs> in a small town, and having the chance to have an office above a bakery. Yes. And that is that's the perfect. Yes. So I would imagine it, you don't deal in essential oil diffusers in here because if you need a scent, you could just you open just up open the, the door. Yeah. Wow. Go in the hallway, and you smell bread, and coffee, and pastries. An it's office dangerous. that smells like <laughs> blueberry muffins all the time. That would just be, yeah. Ugh. It it really is dreamy. I love it. There was a um, there was a space in the town where I was from, uh, Columbia, South Carolina. There was a bakery on Main Street that had apartments above it. And my dream uh -huh. was always to figure out a way to get one of those apartments. Yeah. And just in the morning, just open all the windows. Let all that in. So I have sort of a funny story of how I got this office. Um, I did a training with Marianne Schroer, who, um, if you know her, she's fabulous. She works with CASA mm -hmm. in Franklin. And she was, I was just, I don't know if I was at Meredith's or just I was on the street somehow. Um, and this is eight plus years ago. And she was literally driving on the road and stopped in the middle of the street and was like, Kelly, and I was like, Marianne, oh my gosh. And um, I think, she was like, what, you know, what's going on, what's new, whatever. And I think I said, I'm looking to start a private practice. Let me know if anybody has office space. And she was like, well, I do. I didn't know where it was. I didn't know what she was talking about. Then, you know, I find this. This is like exposed brick, um, hardwood floors. Yeah, this is like if you would see the end result of something on HGTV. Yeah. What you would see. So I literally walked into magic. Was this her space? Yeah. <gasps> yes. Oh, wow. So I subleased from her forever. And then she, I mean, she was working very, very part-time. And then she eventually... Um, just decided not to do private practice anymore. So I took over the, the lease. Wow. Yeah. So it's like this. That was very serendipitous. <laughs> it was pretty great. Wow. Yeah. I got to hang out at a bakery more often. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> just wherever you want to be, just sit there. Yeah. Or under it. Stop cars as they pass by. <laughs> yeah. Do you have an office upstairs? <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Wow. That's great. Yeah. Um, uh, 
so that that is a great uh, story of how you ended up in the space. I, I like to start out every episode by asking people why therapy. Yeah. How did you end up doing this? Yes. So it's funny, like as I was telling that story, because I knew you were going to ask me that question, I was like, um, I think this is how my life kind of is because it's very serendipitous, very just like I'm very passionate. I have a lot of ideas and vision and whatever, but it always like I just follow some kind of passion and then it just turns into something else. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like it's just never like a go with the flow kind of. I mean, I think if you really know me, you wouldn't call me go with <laughs> you talk to my husband. Nobody's ever described me as that way either, but so I feel you also, on that. Also, I don't know. It's like a combination. Anyway, so I was in um, PR. I went to school to, and even in school, I didn't have any idea what I really wanted to do, so I just tried to narrow it down somewhat. Public relations. I was working for a big PR firm in downtown Nashville. McNeely, Pickett, and Fox. Okay. And some of my best friends are still from that group. We meet monthly. Anyways. Were you living the Mad Men dream? Yes. Okay. No, I'm not. That is exactly, yes. We went to, yes, we were all single, and we were, like, we got all the free stuff because we were planning all these events. Yes. Wow. Like, yes. So we're bonded. Right. Okay. And we look back at that time and we're like, oh my gosh, like we were so crazy, but we're all settled down now. And we're good. <laughs> okay. Um, so you went from the world of PR uh -huh. advertising yes, kind of stuff. Yes. And now you're in therapy. Connect yeah. those dots for me. Yes. So I was miserable in the work. I had best friends. I liked my environment, but I was just not, not me. And I took a career assessment test, the strong. Okay. Um, is was a, that through a career counselor or did you just happen upon that? It was actually a career counselor that I did it through. So it wasn't like one of those online, like it was a pretty thorough. Okay. An actual um, assessment, not a yes, BuzzFeed quiz. That's exactly right. Okay. And I, I, I tried to tell people that because if you want to make this life changing thing, you got to do a little more than just Google. Right. Right. Or a magic eight ball. Probably not the best. Right. So I took this test and um, I kind of had my ideas of what maybe I should be doing, but I didn't really. And I, so this test gives you like the top five things that you are, it's like, it's kind of like a personality test, but it's also a um, attribute, um, just like even environment. It takes all these things into context. Okay. And so you are most like blah, 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 blah. Which I think is the best way that an assessment could communicate a result. Yeah. Just because I, I've talked with people who who've asked questions about you know, oh, uh, Myers-Briggs or Enneagram right. or this, that, the other. And I always tell them, hey, so an assessment doesn't define you. That's right. An assessment just says, based on this set of answers you gave it's just, on this day, yeah. people who typically give those answers typically shake yes. out to look it's this data. way. It's data. Yes. It's just data. But if you kind but of recognize... really thorough data. Yeah. If you kind of recognize, all right, well, if I would have taken that test on Thursday instead of Tuesday, and if I'd have taken it before lunch instead of after, mm -hmm. you know, so you kind of hold things loose, but it, it, it certainly gives you a direction right. of understanding. Yes. So the number one answer was therapist oh. and it had never occurred to me, literally never. Had you been to any therapy at that point in time? No. Okay. So you didn't have any kind of concept None. of, except maybe my example is always people's idea of therapy was Fraser Crane. Right. Like something well, like that on yes. in a movie or a TV show. Yes. None of my family had been to therapy. None of my friends have been to therapy. Like literally brand new even idea yeah. for me. So the, 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 what do you call it? The therapist that was giving me this assessment, the career counselor, I guess. 
um, he actually taped the conversation that we had where he revealed the results and explained it to me. And I literal tape, so that's dating me. <laughs> but I have cherished that and listened to it several times because it was a you, life. You have it? I have it. Oh, that's incredible. It was a life-changing conversation. I said, what, I think I'm too emotional to be a therapist. <laughs> He said, okay, so you care about people, but you are no Mother Teresa. I was like, huh, I guess that's true. He said, you have this ability to write yourself. It's called metacognition. And so if you are like maybe taking something home and it's affecting you too much, you have this ability to kind of pull up above yourself, see what you're doing, and write it. Yeah. Metacognition. And I have done that. Like, and my husband and I talk about it all the time. When I get stuck, um, I'll be stuck for you know maybe a couple of days, and I'll do it. I'll have yeah. this process where Richard I Rohr of, calls it observing the other. Yeah. Yeah. And it's uh, well, but when you're the other. Yeah. Is, well, that well, what he says is uh, the um, he compares it to self compassion. So if you are dysregulated, if, if something's going on inside of you, the ability to zoom back, see yourself as an other, and then ask if, if like this that. were a, a, a separate person that I saw with this problem or issue, what would I offer them? Yes. Can I offer it to myself kind of thing? So I... I um I took him at his word, the career counselor, and trusted it. And because he was speaking sort of eerily about how well, like he knew me more than me based on this data. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It was just like, oh my gosh, like how did you know that? Um, I just, just jumped into it. And when I was in my graduate program and I was taking the classes, soaking every bit of it up like a sponge i knew like this is and then it's always been confirmed i've never looked back it just yeah. feels like me where did you do your grad studies at at trebecca oh nice yeah yeah a long time ago yeah yeah mine i i mean i've, I've only been out about two years now but it has a strange that was a lifetime ago and it was yesterday at the same time Oh, yeah, kinda it's kind of an era, right? Mm -hmm. It's like this bubbled time, no matter when you do it. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of, there's a line in uh, Speed, uh, Keanu Reeves, you know, uh -huh. that, where he says something about intense experience is bonding people yes. kind of thing. Because it was this, I like the word you used, era, two and a half years uh -huh. condensed, uh -huh. where you're just like sprinting the whole time. Yeah. But also, due to what you're studying, you can't, I think in a typical, any other program, when you're doing that much work, you could turn yourself off to a certain degree to mm -hmm. get it all done. And you can't do that when you're right. studying therapy. No. <laughs> so it's almost like, you know, you're sprinting, but you also have to remain present and open and engaged emotionally. Well, and you're learning with that even yes. is, well, at least for me, because I think there are a lot of people who go to school because they've been affected by therapy mm -hmm. positively, whether they've received it or a friend has or something like that. Um, but for me, everything was brand new. That's so interesting. And I, I've always wanted to ask somebody coming from that perspective, because I mean, I got into it because therapy gave so much to me. It yeah. was transformational for me. And so I felt very much I've been given, so I want to give. Yep. Um, coming from where you were, having not had the experience yet, right? you know, I, I'm so curious about what that was like. Just because I, I kind of knew going in, I'm studying this thing that I did. So yes. almost like I'm going to take off the back panel and now see how the insides work. But you hadn't done it yet. So, so what was it like to go through all that? The experience that I had 
I can't have it anymore. And I'm going to explain that because I know that's confusing. I was so, I was such a blank slate Mm -hmm. that I was open about every single thing, every single model, every single way of thinking. I was taking it in um, and wondering about it and learning about it and trying it on. And so if I, because, because I was just such a student, it really um, gave me this pure kind of way of developing therapy for myself. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah. So like now I really have landed, but I couldn't go to school again. Sure. And well, you wouldn't be the same person who, right. who went through. Yeah, it shaped me. So I, you know, at one point I was practicing cognitive behavioral therapy, and I was learning everything that I could about it, and was open to it, and had certain influences. Um, and but something didn't like when I actually was doing it. Something didn't quite mm-hmm. sit right. It was then click. You know, so then you know shifted to something else. Then shifted to something else, and. I think that's an in, that's interesting because I think when I went through, obviously I had never been a therapist, but I had been in therapy. Uh-huh. And so to a certain degree, I was filtering everything through my experience. And, and you know, my therapist had never said, Josh, I'm going to use this modality on right, you. And, and uh, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, I did, as we started to learn about the modalities, try to figure out, oh, I, was he this one? Was he that one? Uh-huh, did he, yeah. you know, this kind of thing? And I actually should write him and ask him if he's, if he's got one. But, um, but yeah, and, and I even remember in my practicum, my very first client, mm-hmm. which I found out that I had 13 minutes before the appointment. Yeah. Um, the first thing I thought was, well, what did my therapist do in the first session? Because yes. I didn't even have time to think, well, and how am I going to make so the room look? How natural, am I going to? Right. Because that's, that's what we hold in us is our experiences. Mm-hmm. And so until you're a therapist for a certain amount of time, you don't have any experience. So if you're in therapy, it would be totally natural to hold mm-hmm. that. Yeah. But I like what you said about being a blank slate walking in. Like you're going to give everything a fair shake. How and you're many gonna see. people actually, yeah. Like I kind of wish I still had that in a mm-hmm. way. Does that make sense? I have to work really hard to stay open and curious mm-hmm. now. Back then, it was just it was just yeah because I hadn't had experiences. And I think it, it even exposes what I would say is a bias in me because I've always thought, well, if a person hasn't been to therapy and they're studying it, how are they even gonna you know? Yeah. But now it even seems like it's a strength because you were able to take in all of the information in a way that I wasn't and process it and and. I'm curious, how long after that did you arrive at what you would say is your true self in the counseling room? And I'm wondering Mm -hmm. if you got there quicker than I have been able to, if I've even gotten there yet. (laughs) I think maybe I'm a slow learner. (laughs) Um, I like that wording, true self as a counselor. Gosh, there's there's a parallel process there, right? Because that isn't just about me in the counseling room, that's also about me and my personal life. So mm-hmm. the more true, the more congruent I've been within myself in my most intimate relationships, the more clear things have been for me in the counseling room mm-hmm. as a therapist. So there really is a lot of overlap. Yeah. And I would say that's even true as a parent. Um, of course, I have different roles maybe that's not the best word well but you're not compartmentalizing so you're not saying i am this separate person in my parenting life in my counseling life in my personal life yeah there's it's so maybe the better question is uh, how when do you feel like you got comfortable in the therapy room where you weren't going all right so i've got to ask these questions because it's this modality and, Uh and it just I mean, Josh, I have to be honest, it's only been recent. And 
where you're, it's like in your bones. Mm-hmm. You're not thinking about it anymore. You're just doing it. You have confidence. You don't like doubt every single thing. If it's a bad session, you don't automatically blame yourself. Sure. All of that has been just recent. So I don't know if that's like and you've been depressing in eight years. for people to hear. No. I, well, I think at least for me, it's encouraging it's, just because. I mean, I've been, so I've been, um, let's see, I do this, I need to get this story straight in my head. I do it by my kids' ages. That's the only way I can figure out how long I've been doing this. So my oldest is 10. Okay. And when she was born, I was just licensed. Okay. So, you know, when you're licensed, you've been practicing for what, two, three years, including practicum. Mm -hmm. So what is that? 13? Yeah. (laughs) Something like that. So yeah, that's a long time. Yeah. So I I think for me, it's encouraging just because I I came to the career a little later. Mm -hmm. Like I had a career out of college that I did for 10 years. Uh And then after I left that, uh, two years kind of traveling through the desert, if you will, searching for what's next. Right. And then I started grad school when I was 35. And so, you know, for me, there's always this tension of, well, I'm 38 now. Uh I feel like I, you know, quote unquote, should already have arrived and be comfortable and things like that versus what I know of me as a person and what I know of me in the developmental stage that I'm at, right. giving myself the grace and the permission to know I'm still learning, I'm still developing, I'm still right. kind of, you know, and I think personally, I'm a lot more comfortable with my personal self because of my age and my life stage and the therapy personal work that I've done as mm-hmm. a client. Yes. You know, so I think maybe which I don't know where anybody else is at. For me, at least, it's been a little easier to give myself a little grace of, oh, I'm still figuring this out just because I've had to do that so much in my own life outside of the therapy room. Right, you yeah. Know? But it's still the tension because I still, I want to, there's something in me that wants to have gotten there from the belief that it'll help my clients more. Yes, and that's why we all get into this field in the first place. Yeah. Right? So it comes from a really good place. We Mm -hmm. all genuinely want to help people. Yeah. I think, most of us anyways. Well, that'd be the hope. Yeah. (laughs) So I'm curious, um, tell me a little bit about what exactly it is that you do in therapy right now. So you were in the PR advertising world. Yeah. You, You were dissatisfied. You met with a career counselor. You got the assessment. You did the education. You got the license. Yeah. What does your work look like? Okay, so to kind of continue that trajectory, I fell in love with attachment in grad school. Paris Goodyear Brown was my professor, and she explained it, and I literally lit up. Um, Sort of followed that passion and ended up working with kids and families um, at the Refuge Center. And Kenny Sandifer was my supervisor for licensure. And he um, literally convinced me to go to an externship. And I was like, why would I do that? I work with kids. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Like supervision meeting after supervision meeting, he kept. It was the first externship in Nashville. Oh. So cool. he was needing some numbers. <laughs> And I think he genuinely thought that I would benefit from it, which, of course, changed my whole life, actually. So I went to the externship, and I was like, oh, my gosh. I can work with families by working with couples Mm -hmm. because it's this top-down thing. You know, if you guys are united front and connected and um, doing this interpersonal work in the context of relationship, it's only going to help the whole family system. So I switched gears after that and started my journey, my EFT journey. So now I am 95% my practice is couples okay. using EFT. 
And just in case somebody's coming in, this is their maybe their first episode. Yes. Tell me what EFT means. Yes. Okay. So it stands for emotionally focused therapy, and it has a there's three components that make EFT. EFT is my elevator speech for people okay. who don't want the whole thing, um, or care, or it's your Shark Tank pitch. <laughs> yeah. So emotion, following emotion is key in the model. Um, we, Catherine Rehm, who's an EFT trainer, says, calls emotion the messenger of love. And so if we trust that all emotion is going to get us to where we need to be, we just have to follow it. So that's literally what I do. I'm like a, I don't know, I chase emotion around, mm -hmm. you know, hopefully organize it a bit. <laughs> but experience, experiential, and so that's, we're not going to just talk about feelings. We're going to try to actually access them in the room. Does that make sense? Because you can... Yeah, it's a less of a classroom, more of a laboratory. We're going to actually do something. That's right. Yeah. It's like this practice that's mm -hmm. happening in within the hour, you know? Um, and then the whole framework is attachment. So that's the third component. So emotion, experience, and attachment. So attachment meaning we are hardwired as relational beings. It's in our survival code. It's mm -hmm. in our DNA. Everybody, every human being um, has this attachment system that is operating all the time. Mm -hmm. And then, so through getting introduced to attachment in school through mm -hmm. your experience at refuge with Kenny and now you're working 95% with couples. Yeah. Um, is there any particular aspect of couples work that you deal exclusively in or just kind of couples in general, any couple experiencing anything you'll take? Yeah. You know, I don't know if I've ever been asked that. Like, do I have a niche within couples work? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, just crisis couples. Um, I I interviewed Emily Party. You know, she deals with a lot of you know couples with fertility stuff. Yes. Child loss, that, that kind of thing. Yeah, I see everything with couples. I do think that there are certain certain seasons of my work where I get more referrals of one thing, and I. I'm sure there's a reason for that. Um, I don't know. For me, because I'm so attachment focused, it starts to feel similar no matter what the presenting mm -hmm. thing is. Once we get, there's definitely a different feel to uh, a fair recovery in the beginning, mm -hmm. right? When you're trying to stop the bleeding, so to speak. But then after that happens and everybody, the relationship is really soothed and we start to feel more secure, then it feels really similar. Yeah. I, part of that is I think the beauty of EFT yeah. is because, you know, I think that the overwhelming majority of couples when they come in, well, what's going on with you guys? Well, we have communication issues yeah. is what is typically, you know, said, said right. which is eh, true-ish. You know, yeah. with really what it could be is, all right, as individuals, you have communication issues between your heart and your mouth in that what's going on in your heart is not coming out of your mouth in a way that the other person can receive and take in mm -hmm. and, and be productive. And so, you know, in, in my work with, with addicts, the overwhelming majority of the work is reintegrating them with their own heart they've become divorced from their heart mm -hmm. and so through that reintegration process my joke is always that you end up feeling better you don't feel happier but the quality of your your ability to feel I I improves yeah. so you feel more and you also understand how to deal with your feelings kind of right. thing and so right. you know with eft it, part of that is helping somebody to access their own heart that's right. And then to learn to, I guess I would say, take responsibility for their feelings, use I statements, rather than pointing the finger. Well, you can't know. What find you, the bad guy, so to speak. You right. Know. You can't know what you want until you know what you feel. Yeah. 
So to ask for what you need or want, you know, if if you're not really, if you don't really have access inside, mm -hmm. then um, it's always going to be a mixed signal. Yeah. It's always going to be a scrambled signal, even within yourself and definitely to the people that are closest to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, one of the things I love, um, and I know that we're going to get to talk about this a little bit more later, but in the yeah. Created for Connection book uh -huh. is just how many stories there are of couples where you can see they may come in starting to talk about this is the issue that we're going on. Well, if she would just stop this or if he would just start that, that Raining, kind of thing. Yeah. But as the work continues and you see them drop down from the head to the heart yeah. and begin to speak in terms of, well, I feel this way mm -hmm. as a result of this. And this is what I need in that feeling. Mm -hmm. And you kind of see that process forming of getting in touch with their emotions, being able to trace the cause of or the origin of that emotion and then discovering the need in the emotion and then being able to speak that to their partner and invite them to meet that need. Right. You know, like in my own work, I always said, you know, figuring out what you're feeling is like your bachelor's level work. Um, being able to say what you're feeling is like your master's and then asking for your need to be met is like your PhD. Like, oh, yeah, cause that is hard. just, yeah, <laughs> that is like the ultimate act of vulnerability is it to is. speak a need and ask somebody to meet it. Yeah. And not to just deal with it on your own mm -hmm. or, or bury it or yeah. Try to, yeah. Try to, which I think is another form of dealing it. Dealing, mm -hmm. That's, that's dealing with it, burying it, you know, mm -hmm. just doing something with it sort of, inside by yourself. I almost feel like that would be the dark mirror version of the metacognition that you were talking about before. Like the ability to recognize something's going on and then just to stuff it all down and get it away. Right. Without doing the um, uh, self-soothing or the self-care to, uh, to mm. integrate it and take it in. Yeah, yeah, the dark version. Yeah. <laughs> the darkest timeline version. Yeah, I have an image there. It's mm -hmm. funny. Um, my brain tends to work in pictures. And so... It doesn't? Uh, no, it does, yeah. Oh, it and, does. And so, yeah. So anytime I'm trying to conceptualize something, I always go to, is there an image that I can take in yeah. or that I can create to, yeah. to kind of make that make more sense? We, you know, we use that often and EFT to help people access emotions. Because if you can, if we can change our conversation and have something that we can see while mm -hmm. we're talking, then we can sort of like be, it helps to get out of that headspace, but it can, you know, images really do move mm -hmm. you. And so if it's, if it resonates and it's like, yes, but what's funny though is like when the analogy breaks down, you know, when you're like you have this great image and <laughs> this great mm -hmm. analogy, and, it's not and everybody's enough. jiving and we're like yes, 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 and then it's like and then it's like it's like well, then you know the the boat and the island thing doesn't work anymore yeah. because whatever. Yeah, yeah. I um, some of the work that I did as a client, I remember I was in a group, and we had a homework assignment. Uh, for the next week where we wrote a one page version of our story mm -hmm. and we were going to present it to the group along with that same size piece of paper. We were to draw an image of how we felt in the middle of our story. Okay. And so in this group, we're going one by one. And what we did was we laid the image down in front of us and we read the story to the group. Uh -huh. And then at the end, we would pick up the image and present it, explain, this is what the image is. This is what I meant by it. That kind uh -huh. of thing. So it comes to me and I pick up, you know, my paper and I read the story very matter of factly. I always said, like I was a newscaster. I'm just reporting the facts. Sure. Cause at this point, like I was comfortable enough with it, thought I'd understood it enough. So then it's time to present the image. Well, I bend down and I pick up the piece of paper that I had drawn on and I get out maybe three words when I choke up. Wow. And in this group, which was a half a year long group, yeah. we, we did stuff with uh, 
with art several times. Uh And it was always one of the most powerful things to me. And in, and I think it was just in the process of, you know, Hey guys, we're going to have you draw, you know, this for whatever. What I had to do first was think about whatever the assignment was in a way that I could simplify it into an image that I could find something to represent it, which was a different way of processing. Yes. And then in explaining it, I, I was basically walking back through the processing, but I'm, I, I said to my wife the other day, she, she was asking something about what is it about? I, I see you in no matter what role you're in, you're doing some kind of teaching. What is it about that that really lights you up? And mm-hmm. I was like, well, I think it's a way to connect with people, but I also think it's a way for me to learn. Because if right. I take something in right. and I can teach it to somebody else in a way that they can get it, it means that I've integrated it enough uh, to where I can explain it simply. Yes. And so I think the part of that image presentation that we would do in this group was that as well, was it was integrating it enough to where you could explain it, boil it down, right. I guess, in, in a simple right. way. Right. But it was so powerful it is. to just take this one. And I had literally read this whole story and then in picking up a picture, yeah. all of a sudden something access, connected. You access a different part of yourself. Oh, yeah. You kind of dropped into a part of yourself. Um, when you said teaching, so I'm an EFT supervisor mm-hmm. now, and I had no idea how much I would learn as a supervisor. Hmm. Because I'm an EFT supervisor, I remember the three components, one of them is experiential. So when my supervisees want to staff a case, instead of me kind of running it through what would I do or blah, blah, blah. The, even the supervision has to be experiential. So we do a lot of role plays. So I'll be the client and my supervisee will be the therapist and I'll you know, be this like little jerky, stubborn <laughs> something. This is so fun. This is like, I don't know, make believe. Um, but then because I am, tr- I am having to access some of, like, yeah, it is like acting, right? Like, those actors, they feel, mm-hmm. which is... Well, it's method acting. I mean, they put themselves in the shoes of... That's right. ...that character. And, and you can't fake emotion. Mm-hmm. You've actually, I mean, obviously. So, I'm doing this, and my supervisees are doing great work as therapists, and... I am so, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's what that does. Like I feel it at, in the client seat and it helps me as a therapist. So anyways, it's yeah. really cool. Nice. Um, in the same way that you said you've still got that tape. Yeah. I still have that picture. Okay. That I drew. Oh, yes. Yeah. And I will, I will, it's in a. Is it framed on your wall? No, it's in a three <laughs> ring binder. Um. I knew being in that group, which this was before I had any inclination that I would pursue therapy as a career. I knew being in that group, this is something special. And so day one, I began to write down everything. And any homework that we had outside of the group, I wrote it down and I put it all in this binder. And it is a three inch, three ring binder. Wow. And I still have it. And it's like, this beautiful and terrible record Mm -hmm. of this very specific 26 week period of work in my life. And it, it's one of my favorite things in the world. It it's in the top of my closet on a top shelf, but I, I will pull it down uh, every now and then because I'll, I remember even, um, an activity was done that impacted me so much. I was like, I need to write down every aspect of this activity so I can remember it. And I'll go back and refer to those things because even as a client, I was writing down questions of, I wonder why they did it this way. I wonder why they did it that way alongside my experience of it. And so now as a therapist being clinically trained, I can go back and I can answer some of those questions and go, Oh, that's what they were doing there. That's what they were. I mean, it sounds like you were waking up 
you know, as a, to yourself. Mm. Oh yeah. And you were so excited about it and interested. And I mean, that's, it's beautiful. It's really interesting to me though, that I had the inkling that this would be something important to have a record of. Cause I really didn't at the time think I could use this in a career one day. I was just thinking this is important for me as a person. And I think even better though, because then it wouldn't have been authentic. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like this was like just you in that moment. Mm-hmm. And so to pull from that with a di- different context, mm-hmm. so valuable. Yeah. I, um, I used to say when, when I was in my first career working in churches, I would go to conferences all the time that weren't necessarily within my realm of uh, area of responsibility. Uh-huh. Like I would go to the Willow Creek Arts Conference all the time, and people at my church would ask, you're the youth pastor, why are you going to the arts conference? And I said, because stuff that reaches me as a person bleeds more naturally into the work that I do. Yes. Rather than if I go to the conference that's designed for the tasks that I do, it right. it it doesn't have the chance to go through that personal filter first. So in a way it's almost a little more detached right. from what I do than if it runs through the personal filter first. And I think, you know, that's in a way related to kind of what you were saying before about, you know, we as therapists, so much of this is who we are. We mm-hmm. were talking about being comfortable in the room and that kind of thing. Yeah. You know, so if you can process stuff through you as a person first, um, which that's, you know, that's outside of the skills kind of level of certain yeah, things. Yeah, but I mean, we are like our person is the greatest tool mm-hmm. in therapy. And so I, you know, I think it does take some training and practice to learn how to use even your triggers as signals Mm -hmm. of what to do in a moment for an intervention Mm -hmm. here. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, it's in the same way that we would help our clients to realize, uh, get connected with their own hearts, Mm -hmm. that those emotions that you're experiencing, those are messages that your heart's telling you that something's happening you need to pay attention to. That's the same way that in the room we're paying attention to everything that's happening inside of us because if we're getting a certain trigger, like as an example, I had a client one time that came in, he was experiencing uh, a crisis in his relationship and he was very defensive, very defensive. Never heard him say anything about what I did was wrong, I'm sorry, that kind of thing. And he was going on and on and on one day about how, you know, he's tried to explain to her this, that, and the other. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting in the chair and every red flag is going off in me where I am starting to feel afraid in the chair. Uh And I eventually was able to get him to stop. (laughs) And I said, you know, I can't help but wonder when you talk to her, do you talk to her this way? Because you're not a small person and, and I'm not a small person and everything inside of me is screaming danger right now. And I can't imagine based on how you've described her being smaller in stature that she would not feel afraid as well. Mm-hmm. And it totally unseated him from this whole kind of way that he was thinking because he was in this kind of, I'm logically proving that da 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 right and was not even thinking about like he had no real awareness that how, the impact that yeah. might have and we're talking about like a six five so even for you to share the impact it has on you mm-hmm. was like a step yeah of oh my gosh okay mm-hmm. yeah but I, that was something i recognized oh i'm feeling Yes. This in the moment. Right. And you could have done a lot of things with that. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of decision points there, which is fine, right? So, like, let's say that that happens and we, instead of moving in, we moving into the moment, like recognizing that as a, this is important, this matters, let's engage mm-hmm. as therapists, we could sort of flee. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, okay, I'm just going to like 
draw on my whiteboard and teach mm-hmm. you about something just so which oh. I've done that too. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> this is, but what I love about, I don't know if I'm going to say even if it's EFT or if it's just being a human and as a therapist in a therapy space, is that it is a relationship. And so let's say that I do the wrong, big air quote, move and try to regulate myself by doing something that's not necessarily helpful mm-hmm. in therapy, maybe doesn't do harm, but it's not like actually helpful. Um, there's always room for repair. Yes. And so I, you know, I, in that session, I go and I think to myself, Oh my gosh, what in the world? What happened? Like I didn't have enough space and time to even figure out what was happening for me or it was too big of a trigger, whatever. It doesn't matter. I talk to a colleague, I process it, you know, I sit with it within myself and I can figure out, oh, this is, okay, this is the moment that I got triggered. Yes, that makes so much sense. Oh, what did I do with it? Okay, I went psycho ed. Totally makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, I can go back and say, you know what? I think I missed it. I think I missed you last time. You were saying this and I think that's really important. Can we go back to that moment would that be okay or just whatever it might be but isn't that a beautiful thing like there's always repair yeah it really is um well i want to i want to get into talking about the movie what movie did you bring for us to talk about i'm so excited it is called about time about time i this movie had been on my radar for a little bit i had a, a good buddy back home that had said this was like one of his favorite movies and I should watch it. And it's been one of those where like I've had it on a, a, a in a queue or on a list or something uh-huh. and I just had not gotten to it. And so when you said, Oh, I think I want to do this. I was like, yeah. perfect. Great. Uh-huh. Good. Cause you were thinking about it already. Oh yeah. So we watched it last night and you did. It <laughs> wrecked me. Okay. Yes. I don't think I've ever watched it. I've watched, I own it because I so it is kind of a word of mouth movie. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's, it always surprises me how many people have not seen this movie or maybe even heard of it. Um, but the people who have seen it sort of say similar things like what you're saying. It's kind of this life changing, wrecking, gorgeous oh, movie. Oh yeah. Um, Directed by the same guy that did Love Actually. Which you can totally feel when you mm-hmm. watch it. Right, and it's British, mm-hmm. so it's very British, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which I do like. Um, I'm forgetting you had a question. Did you have a question? You said I meant to say something when I was saying about the movie. I'm just so excited to talk yeah. about this movie. Well, I don't think I'd ask a question yet. I mean, the, the initial question is always, what was it about this movie that attracted you to it and made you want to talk about it? Okay, so. It does have a lot of relation, obviously relational, it's a relationship movie. Um, but I think honestly, the reason that I wanted to talk about it is because there really hasn't been another movie that has influenced me and moved me so deeply. Oh, I know what I was going to say. The wrecking you Mm -hmm. thing for me, it's the, like one of the last scenes with the dad and the son. Is that... Is it the walk? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> On the beach. Yeah. Is that... when it happen for you or oh, what? Oh, I mean, there no, there's not one scene. There's many. Most of them are towards the end. Right. Um, I want to ask you a silly question. Okay. All right? I'm recognizing that it's silly. Um, this has not happened so far on the podcast. It barely ever happens in real life, but I'm sitting in the room with you. We both have red hair. Yes. (laughs) Um, and I'm wondering, did any, did anything in the movie, like obviously the main character ends up having children, these gorgeous Uh red haired little girls. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if anything like that, cause you just don't really see in movies a whole lot. People with red hair. Like, it's just not... And if you do, it's something like in the Avengers where, like, Scarlett Johansson has the worst red-haired wigs I've ever seen in my whole life. I know, I know, I know. Like, please, just don't try. Yeah. Um, 
I do have a snobbery about redheadedness. I do. So maybe subconsciously I was pulled in <laughs> because of the character I'm like, in Domo Gleason. Yes. Yes, I know. I just love redheads. I feel like we're a special breed. Um, I don't know. Yeah, maybe. And then when he, I don't know, I don't want to say too much about the scene well, uh, where... Let me, let me say this. So <laughs> uh, anybody that's listening, if you haven't seen the movie yet... Just go see it. You're gonna, we're going to get to the part later on in the conversation where I, I usually ask people, is this a rent, buy, or pass? For me, total buy. Yes. Absolutely buy it. So let me just say this. If you're listening right now, you haven't seen About Time yet, pause the show, go to Netflix, find it, watch it, Hit, yes. pa- hit unpause and come back and listen because at great, this point we're going to yes. talk spoilers. So I can't even like speak in clear sentences anymore now that we're talking about <laughs> this <laughs> movie. Like my mind, I'm so excited. There's so much like other things that we started to say. So you're going to have to help me. That's all right. Yeah. We're therapists. We can help organize people's emotions now and Now I'm like a client right yeah. now. I'm just like... Well, let's start with this. So, okay. I, you know, I asked you, what is it about the movie that drew you to it? So let's go with, how does this movie make you feel? Okay. Thank you. I need your help here. <laughs> um, gosh. This is going to sound so weird. Sad and inspired. Like, at the same time. I get that, though. That okay. doesn't sound weird. So... I wept and wept and wept, and I didn't even know why I was crying at the end of the movie. And the next, the first time I watched it, and the next day, I literally did my day differently. Hey, hey, everybody, this is Josh, and I'm interrupting the episode to ask for your help in getting more people into the theater. Do you have a favorite episode of Therapist Theater? Take a second and find it in your podcast app. Now, hit the share button and send it to a friend that you think would also enjoy it. The best way to help us on our mission to make mental health more accessible and understood is to share the show. Oh, and one more thing. Make sure you stay tuned until the end of my interview with Kelly for a special promo code for a discount on a special couples training that she and some other EFT therapists put on. Thanks so much for your help. Now, back to the show. One of my favorite things in life is watching movies with Leanne Treese, with my wife. I love it. Yes, yes. Mainly because she is a crier with a capital C, capital R, capital all the letters. I like her. I need to meet her. She is a crier. I have gotten to the place where now I can know when it's about to happen. Yes. So if we don't have a tissue with us, I'll get up off the couch and go grab one oh. and bring it back. And like even last night, she oh. said, I'm not crying yet. And I was like, I know. <laughs> my family, and within two okay. or three minutes, my it was family, there. My family, we will watch. I mean, this is ridiculous. We're watching The Voice right now mm-hmm. like with my two oldest. Um, and so we put the baby to bed. He's four years old, but he's still the baby. And then the, the four of us watch The Voice. And my girls will turn their head and go, Mom, are you crying? And I'm like, stop. No. Stop <laughs> looking at me. Yes, I cry all the time. So what, if you can remember the first time you saw it, what was the first scene where the tears started flowing? Mm. Gosh, what a great question. Okay. Um, I don't know if. I actually let it go until the very end. So it was very, the movie itself is, you don't, it's not one of those movies that you sort of stop watching. Like you engage the whole time. It's excellent. You know, the pacing of it is really good. And it's, um, it's, a, it's like an easy movie to watch mm-hmm. as far as that goes. But I don't know if I was like, like there are scenes that were moving and beautiful, but I, it was almost like I was just so engaged in it and then it all came out at the end. And so I don't want to say too much about that 
why it came out because I feel like I'm going to spoil it. But Yeah, but we've already given the spoiler warning. We're good. So we can do that? Yeah, we've opened up the gate. Yeah, so like this is on you, listener, if you haven't watched the yeah. movie yet. Just trust us. Go watch it. <laughs> Pause again. Yeah. Because I'm about to spoil it. So at the very end, um, so, okay, if we're going to tie this into therapy, the dad and the son probably have the most beautiful, secure attachment that I've really seen. And I would mm-hmm. say even the, the marriage relationship, that they are pretty securely attached. So when you watch this movie, what it does, I think, is it, it um, kind of pokes at anybody's human longings. And you see these beautiful relationships and everybody has, everybody longs for this securely attached oh, yeah. relationship, right? This, this bond with another person where you are completely free to be yourself. Yeah. You see the safe harbor he has with his dad oh, my gosh. and you see it develop and, and cement itself with his wife. Exactly. As well. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And how it with his dad contributes to his ability to form it with his wife. Yes. Yes. And so, but the dad isn't this perfect, um, I do everything right dad. Like he, he is human. He's so human in this movie Mm -hmm. and he's so open and so kind. Anyways, I like really could cry even talking about I this. I told Leanne last night, I was like, I'm going to cry during this interview tomorrow. <laughs> it's going to happen. In this final scene, the dad is dying. And so, okay. The whole, the, it's a time traveler mm-hmm. movie. And so, but they can only The premise travel. of the movie is yes. Uh, just after New Year's Eve, one year, dad invites son up for a talk and he says, you know, hey, big family secret. Yep. So, you know, therapist ears perk up right there. Um, (laughs) (laughs) The men in our family can travel through time. But only in your lifetime. Only the things that we've been to and seen. We can't travel to the future because that's ridiculous. I think is exactly what he says. (laughs) Something like that. Yes. You know, um, well, how do we do it? Oh, it's easy. That's the easiest part. So what's amazing, though, is that so this extended family there had been men in the family that had traveled for reasons for success. Um, you know, I think, well, success and money, there's some other reason Mm -hmm. like anyways, but these two men, the dad and the son, the only reason that they traveled in time was for relationship. So they wanted to, well, dad said he did it to read all the books. Okay. Yes. Yeah, like second, second and you layer. find And you find out later that dad had been doing relationship the whole time. Right. But at the beginning, he just, pres- he says, you got to find your That's reason why. That's what he said. Yes, yes, yes. He modeled something different, but he said, oh yeah, I've read everything. I've read everything twice and Dickens three times. Yes. Um, That's but, so interesting that, mm-hmm. okay, that makes but, me think. But, but you but, find out later that he had been doing the relationship thing. Which um, is the last scene. Yes. So he's dying. Who quits and working? at this point, the son and the dad have this, because the son's been doing it. He's been going back in time. And they have this knowing. Oh, like, it really, it's right here. Mm-hmm. I've just, the scene. And I think the son asked the dad something like, is there anything that you would like or something like that? Well, let's pause for just a sec. Because we're, we're leaving something out. So he, in his time travels, the son discovers that yes. because he and his wife are having children. Yes. So they have a daughter, beautiful red-haired baby girl. Yes. And then he goes, uh, uh, something happens where his sister has a fight with her boyfriend. Yep. She's been drinking. She gets into a car accident. So he asks the sister, exactly when did you leave the house? Uh-huh. Exactly from where, at what time? He goes back, helps her get to where she needs to go without right. getting in an accident. That's right. When he goes back home, you know, you're thinking, oh, did something change? It's the back to the future kind of thing. Of uh-huh. some, you know, make a choice here, it changes there. Yep. Did something change? And you see his wife and you're like, whoo. And then he's like, where is our little bundle of joy? And he uh-huh. goes in to pick up the kid and it's a brown haired boy. Yes. And you're like, <laughs> the what? Hair. 
Yes. <laughs> You're like, what? So then he talks to his dad and he's like, oh yeah, if you make any changes, because with, with your kid, it was a specific sperm That's at right. a specific time, you know, that kind of thing. So, so what he be... discovers is his kids have to become fixed points of time. Yeah. Yeah. So he goes back and allows his sister to get into the wreck so that his daughter, which is huge, is the same. There's yeah. a lesson in itself of that, mm-hmm. of like what yeah. you really should, you can't control. Yeah. You know? And so he, and also things that maybe hurt become a part of your story that are necessary exactly. for you to have that's, moving that's exactly forward. exactly what I was saying. And so he, at this point in time with his dad, with this talk, he's getting ready to have his third kid. In fact, right before he does the, the time travel thing, he's laying in bed with his wife who is the most pregnant at this point in time. Yeah. And he realizes, all right, this kid is about to be a real kid. Yeah. And so he gets out of bed, walks down the hall, uh, which is dark and then does the thing that allows him to go back. And when he's yeah. with his dad, they play a little game of ping pong, which they had, that's kind of their thing. Yep. And his dad kind of realizes, Oh, this is it. This is the last time. Yes. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Cause they're, they have this knowing that, you know, there's limitations to what they can do because of the choices that yeah. they, but it's the last time because it's the last time if he does it again after the kid's born, it'll for change the several kid. reasons. Cause the dad's dying and because they don't yeah. want to mess up the kid mm-hmm. thing. And so they go and he, he said, I just want one last walk on the beach and his like, um, just, expression of love how unapologetic he was and free about it like it was so beautiful and when he asks for that walk they together go to a dark place travel back in time and the walk is on a beach and it's tim is the main character it's tim as a boy yes. walking with his dad and this bright red hair on that beach and they're skipping stones and they themselves are kind of running around and skipping and holding hands and they're walking up and down these big stairs that lead down to, to the beach. And it's just this moment where I can only imagine, you know, the dad, you know, held in his heart as this is just my perfect moment. Yes. You know, wow. Kind of the representation of what life was to him. Yes, that's a beautiful way to put it. And I think that's why, like, even now, I'm, like, holding, trying not to be a blubbering idiot on this (laughs) podcast, crying. I'm, like, literally have tears in my eyes, not in my throat, because that's exactly it. That's why I wept and wept and wept and wept, because that represents what we all long for, cherish, try to hold on to, um, but we miss sometimes, Mm -hmm. you know? Sometimes we just miss it. And so it's inspiring to just not miss yeah. it. Yeah, and I think it's, it's right around that same time, and I don't know if it's just before that scene or just after, where he says his dad gave him some advice about mm-hmm. the time travel thing. Yes. And he says um, <clears throat> to l- go through every day normally with all the worries and all the stresses and all the anxieties. And then you live the day again a second time. Yeah. Just looking for those little tiny yes. moments of connection, those yes. little tiny things that matter. And he, you know, and so Tim, the character who Domino Gleason plays, um, says that he did that for a while. And it shows you, like in the movie, you see him mm-hmm. like a day and you see him going back. And it's, that's something that's really motivating. And he said, but I got to the point where I didn't do a second day. I just decided to yeah. pretend like this. That's that inspiring piece you were talking about. Yes. <laughs> so it's like I need to see this movie like every month so that I can like reboot. Well, you know what's <laughs> funny? So so last night uh, after we watched it, I uh, got on Instagram and I put up as a part of my story uh I didn't use the movie poster because the movie uh-huh. poster is terrible. I hate it. it. Is. It's the worst design <laughs> thing I've ever seen in my life. I just found a picture of uh, Domino Gleason and, and, and uh, oh. Rachel McAdams. Yes, Rachel McAdams. That was the poster, but without the terrible font. 
uh, <laughs> writing on it. And then I just wrote stuff on there. Like I just saw this. It's wrecked me. I'm doing an interview with the podcast tomorrow. I'm probably going to cry a bunch during that. Right. And I had a buddy that wrote me and, um, he, in, in response to the story, he said, um, one of the best, my sister saw it in theaters and dragged me with her the very next day. It's now become a staple in my family. Oh. We watch it multiple times a year for every get together and holiday. It's <sighs> just beautiful. And then he tagged me on an old post of his from 2014. And look at this. Oh my gosh. It's the, it's the, it's the album. That that his dad plays for him the song Il Mondo. um, And the caption for it is Jimmy Fontana, Il Mondo, greatest record ever recorded by an Italian who looks like he's got a dead badger on his head. And that is totally a reference. And yeah, and that's, yes, that's the album from the movie. And it's the song that Rachel McAdams, her character's name, uh, Mary, walks down the aisle to. Yes, as a surprise to Tim. Mm -hmm. And, uh, oh. and he says, I'm not kidding about my love for <laughs> about time. And it's, and it, the post is from five years ago. I need to, I need to know this friend of yours. Yeah. I, I am clearly a freak about mm-hmm. this movie. I just so, love it. So, you know, you mentioned that that's a part that got you. Um, the first, I'm going to call it a micro tier that formed for me. Okay. Was... At the reception <laughs> of oh, because there's macro tears that come later. <laughs> and you know what? Like I, it's probably not fair for me to say that I didn't cry till the end. I probably did, but maybe you telling me this will help me. Well, I think that this is a movie where subsequent viewings you just experience it so differently. That's true. Because the initial viewing that you're seeing it. It's laying so many breadcrumbs out, and it is in the end where everything kind of connects up. Yes. And so I think watching it again, you'll you'll spot these things that maybe your subconscious clocked yeah. that first time, but now your conscious mind's yeah. going to clock. So for me, the first micro tear showed up when uh, the wedding reception. Oh. He is going through the best man speeches. Yes. So yes. he has one best man that speaks. Which is speaks. hilarious. Yeah, he has one best man that speaks, and then he goes, nope. And then he time travels back and chooses a different one. Yeah. That one it's speaks. Like four or nope. something. Yeah. And then in the end, it's his father yes. who gives the best man speech. And it's a beautiful speech. It and is. And then he and his dad are sitting down, and his dad goes something like, you know, I didn't say I love you. And he's like, what? It was perfect. He goes, no. It's not perfect to say I love you. So his dad goes and time travels. (laughs) He does it again. (laughs) And then does it again just so he can say I love you in the speech. (laughs) I know. And he says something along the lines of, you know, I am proud of many things that I've done in my life, but none of them have made me as proud as being your dad. Yes. And and that was for me, that's the micro tier. Yeah, I probably I probably shared that micro tier. Yeah. The um it's a beautiful the moment. macro tier for me, yes. where I just, Lost I mean, it. my glasses had to come off. I had to like be wiping, you know, my eyes. Actually, wasn't because of something that the movie showed. Mm-hmm. It was because of something that I heard in the movie. So throughout the whole movie, right. I had been hearing this musical cue. I had been hearing this musical theme that, okay. that was happening throughout the movie. And I knew that I recognized it, that I had heard it before, and uh-huh. I just couldn't place it. And so the movie's right around two hours, somewhere in there. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm watching it, and every time I hear it, I'm just like, what is that thing? And then all of a sudden, um, just after, sometime after the dad's funeral, it's in a kitchen or something there and um the musical cue comes back and then they allow the words of the song to come in and it's the luckiest by ben folds who is one of my favorite artists of all time oh so you had recognized it but you couldn't put your finger on it but i couldn't put my finger on it oh my goodness and then all of a sudden as soon as the first like three words he sings come in Uh i'm I'm sitting in the living room and my hand goes in my mouth i'm like oh my gosh it's the luckiest by ben folds (laughs) and i mean just you know at that point i can't i can't hold it back and it's 
I mean, the lyrics, I don't get many things right the first time. In fact, I'm told that a lot. Now I know all the wrong turns, the stumbles and falls brought me here. You know, and where was I before the day, I'm getting ready to start crying now, <laughs> that I first saw your lovely face. And I, now I see it every day and I know that I am, I am, I am the luckiest. Oh my gosh. And it's, it's, it's right around the part where he talks about, I don't, I don't live it twice now. I just live it yes. once. That's when the <gasps> words come in. And so it so was this. It sounds like this mo- This song was written from a movie. Do you think oh, it's just so no. perfect? Oh well, I mean, the song came out like ten or twelve years before okay, the movie so did. Okay, so no. I mean, it is perfect. It is, yeah. Oh. And what's funny is, like that song, I had heard so long ago and loved then. Right. But it had, you know, it had fallen back into the recesses of my mind right. to where I was hearing that musical cue and I couldn't clock it. And it was when those words kicked in. It was like the song and the movie yeah. and then my own personal experience yeah. all kind of converge Converged in this once. moment all at once. Yeah. And that's for me like, oh. So I think what we are talking about truly is longings. That is why we cry mm-hmm. is because it's hitting at these deep human longings of connection and relationship. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's that's why I chose the movie in the um, therapist yeah. way. Truly, 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 when you asked me, I was like, I can't make the connection right now, like how this fits in with EFT. But I just want to talk about it about time. Well, you know, I don't. And whenever I ask a guest to come on, you know, unless they have that movie right away. I always try to give them three things that I think helps, Uh you know, the first being, is there a specialty or a passion area that you work in that you can think of a movie that communicates some part of that? Yeah. Because I want the guests to be able to speak from their own heart, Yeah. you know, to have that connection. And then if, if maybe there's not something along those lines, I always ask them, you know, is there a movie that when you watch it makes you want to be in relationship? Yeah. Or is there a movie when you watch it that makes you want to be alone forever? <laughs> yeah. Because it's kind of one of these things where, you know, in, on one hand, you can talk about the good parts of relationship. And on another, you could talk about the unhealthy, you know, totally. kind of the bad parts. Totally. Um, so something that my clients will say a lot when they're trying to recover from something, a wound in the relationship, um, you know, just a negative coping strategy, whatever, is they'll often say, yeah, I know it just takes time. And to which I always say, yes, but it's moments in time. Mm -hmm. And that is what this movie is about. Yeah. For me. And what, the hour in which I spend with my clients is about. So I literally have, I, because I work with couples, I have them access these deep parts of themselves, these longings, fears. And when they get there, I say, could you maybe look at your partner in the eyes and share that? Mm-hmm. That's a moment in time. And yeah. those are the crucial, crucial interventions that we use in EFT. Mm-hmm. And so it really is where change happens. So I just think, you know, we can talk all day about being present, which is kind of what this movie is about. But until we look in the eyes of the people that mm-hmm. we want to be in relationship with. Well, that's with. that laboratory thing we were talking about earlier. You know, I I think that to a certain degree, and this is certainly, I think, my, as a person, default nature, you know, we can recognize there's a problem. We can get 17 books about the problem and read 17 different books. But until, yeah, but until we kind of put those things into practice, and that's, you know, before we started recording, I was telling you about some resources that I wanted to develop. Yeah where for me, it's got to have a practical element. It's got to have a place where the rubber touches the road and you can do something with this knowledge. So, you know, in EFT, we have these things called uh, enactments. Mm -hmm. And that's what you were saying is when you ask the couple, can you look at each other 
can you, you know, uh, the first word that came to mind was role play, but that's not quite it. Can you reenact this argument that you've had? Or can you just say what you just said to me yeah, to can you, them? Like, yeah, and it's, it, it is, what's interesting is even though it's an intervention and it's something that we're asking them to do, it becomes its own living, breathing thing when it happens. Because mm-hmm. when a client looks at me and gets teary and shares this deeper part of themselves mm-hmm. or new, ex- something new, and I say, oh, yes, 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 I reflect it back. Is that what it is? Yes. I wonder if you can, sh- can share that right now. They will look at their spouse, and all of a sudden, they will use different words. Oh, yeah. They will cry more. They will. So it becomes its own living, breathing thing because that relationship is its own living, mm-hmm. breathing thing. Does that make sense? So it's not it even just sense. the act of doing it. It's much more powerful than that. Well, you know what's funny? Um, a, a, a couple of episodes ago, I had uh, Will Mooney on. He works yeah. for Sage Hill. I know Will. Oh, I he like is him just a lot. first time I'd ever met him, and I just felt this kinship with him. I can't wait to hang out with him. Yeah. Um, but we were talking about our experiences in learning how to do therapy and being tied to a clipboard, you know, as yeah. the as the client speaking, writing it all down because you want to, you know, uh-huh. and then just realizing as you go on, you can trust yourself to remember. He he made an interesting point. He said what he has learned is that he remembers things that emotion is tied to. And so if he's really attuned with his client, you know, and he is not necessarily feeling for them or feeling their emotions so they don't have to, but if he's allowing himself to be present because of his feelings, he remembers. And one of the aspects of EFT that I, that first kind of attracted me to it was, I think it's called the corrective emotional experiences. And so what we were talking about earlier in helping a client as a part of a couple access their own feelings. Yeah. Uh, and then you were just saying, if you can have them turn and say it, they use this different language because all of a sudden, as they're looking at their partner, maybe yeah. the first time that they interacted with this uh, emotion, experience, scenario, whatever, when they spoke to their partners with, I call it the angry eyebrows, but it's the, you know, the turn down because oh, yeah. it's, yeah. you know, you so and so and I can't believe, you know, yeah. this. But now that they've integrated, they've gotten in touch with their heart. Yes. And they're attuned to turn to their partner and to say, hey, I'm lonely for you and I need you or whatever it is that they need to say. Yeah. All of a sudden, it's this true self, true emotion speaking a need to their primary attachment figure and asking them to meet it. It doesn't erase what's happened before, but it lays on top of it what really needed to and could have been said earlier. And yeah. so it, it almost, it's that um, repair that happens after the hurt. Yeah, and there's a lot of work that leads up to what you're talking about, oh, the yeah. corrective emotional experience. Because in order to be that vulnerable and be that in touch and curious and reach like that there has to be a lot of safety you gotta feel in safe. the relationship and so you know we talk about these enactments um but what you know if any therapists are listening don't worry like what we're talking about isn't supposed to happen and it's like, not first session work <laughs> or even <laughs> sixth session or seventh it what happens is they turn they say something beautiful to you and then they turn to their spouse and it changes in a bad way yeah because there isn't safety and so moments in time right that is just as important what's what what is the block what happens inside for you that you know it's kind of like switches when you Mm -hmm. turn and you look at your partner and um i don't know i just think that all of this really does have a lot of parallel with this movie because yeah go to circle it back let me ask you this so clearly from the beginning of the movie where tim was you see him at this new year's eve party where it strikes uh almost at noon uh midnight yeah and he's next to this girl yeah and he shakes her hand 
yeah. at midnight. Yeah. You know, then his dad introduces this concept of time travel to him. He goes back and he kisses her. Yes. What do you think that this experience for Tim, what was his block? Yeah. Okay. And what do you think that this unlocks in him? I love this. Him? Like, thank you for giving me a scene because this helps me. So in therapy, a lot of times we are using, well, not a lot of times, all the time in EFT, I'm using this present experience, but often they're talking about maybe a fight they had the week before, mm -hmm. right? So when we slow down what happened sort of like on natural speed the week before, and we slow down and we get a little under the surface and, and they turn and share, it's almost like a redo, right? It's kind of the like corrective emotional yeah. going back in time and sharing what that other layer of what was happening simultaneously. So I think that's what Tim was doing. And so, you know, his knee jerk response was to avoid this awkward girl that he didn't actually want to kiss. He was probably hoping for somebody else and that didn't happen. But then what he realized was he like devastated her um, and she's a nice girl and mm -hmm. he recognizes this. So hindsight's twenty twenty. So he goes back in time and kisses her. So I think the block was just humanity. I think he was just like, you know, I long for something better. That sounds terrible. Um, but I don't think it does at all. It, it's what I always tell my clients. You just got a bad case of being a person. Right. Yeah. Like, it, I think that so much of my work is just kind of validating and affirming people to let them know, and especially working with addicts where shame is so prevalent, right. to let them know your shame is going to tell you that you're the only one in the world. Yes. I'm going to tell you that you are, in fact, a part of an exclusive group that includes every human that's ever lived. <laughs> you are human. We're all in the club. You're human, and you yeah. tell yourself these horrible things, and you think this horrible thing and um but at the bottom of it you have these very beautiful longings and fears that make so much sense yeah yeah um one of the things that i think was a connector for me in the movie was it it was after tim found out that his dad had cancer mm -hmm. <clears throat> and he, he came home but he had done a time travel back to talk to his dad and his dad said something along, and, and his dad, when we meet him in the movie, you know, Tim says that he is something along the lines of like an ordinary guy or something. And then when his dad introduces this concept of time travel and he talks about how he's used it to read everything. Yeah. So Tim comes in to talk to his dad and his dad is on the couch with a book and he says, let me just read you this little bit of Dickens. And so I, they, they end up talking, but his dad says something to him along the lines of, well, who, who stops working at 50? Well, it's, it's gotta be just somebody who wants to spend his time playing table tennis with his son or something like that. And you uh -huh. just realize the way that his dad is, was a conscious intentional choice that he made so that he could spend more time with him and which connects to like, clearly dad knew that he was going to have cancer so he time traveled oh, back yes. to spend all of these extra hours and days and weeks and times with him because he loved him so much right. that he wanted to soak in extra, even more time uh -huh. with him and spend that time with him. Were you taking notes or something? No. How have you like yeah. figured I'm all this I'm telling you, this out? movie wrecked me. Uh, <laughs> like, it did me too, but I've seen it like five <laughs> times and you're making connections. So I was like, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, I mean, I think, so for me, there, there's a there's a through line that travels through, you know, it's a filter that everything gets processed in. You know, I, I part of my story is, um, involves my dad a lot and it involves forgiving my dad. It involves, you know, an ongoing effort to build a relationship with my dad. Yeah. Um, so for me, one of the reasons why I sat in silence at the end of the movie, just kind of like soaking in tears was it's exactly what you're talking about. It's recognizing the longing still exists in me for the yeah. type of relationship with my dad that Tim had with his. Yeah. And so to see his dad realize in a moment in time, that speech would have been better if I said, I love you. And then to go back and to say it, 
to see his dad realize at a moment in time, all of this that I've done was in an effort to spend time with you. Yeah. You know, to see at the end, his dad say, I just want one more walk. Right. You know, is it for me, it was highlighting this longing that I have inside of me with your dad, you know? And so for me, those kinds of moments, dad and son, that's really easy for me to clock because you know, there's always a program running in the back, uh, of my software that's looking for that because it is something that I want so much. Yeah. 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 Well, I think it's beautiful to let yourself feel that. Oh yeah. You know, because if, I don't know, it is so human and it's so deep. I love that there's a movie that I would, I would be very curious for somebody that maybe was a little bit more um, shut down emotionally, what would happen? Because I think that movies can be, because I'm, I'm, I'm saying what you're saying, that we all have these longings. Mm-hmm. That it doesn't matter who you are, right? Like that this is just human. Um, I think movies can be a safe way to tap into some of those longings. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I think for me, before I really did my own work and got in touch, there were certain times in my life where if I was feeling something, I had a movie that I would go to and watch it Uh because it brought that feeling out more in me. So it was a little bit, you know, kind of a, I remember in school, we talked about the use of metaphors as a way to introduce feelings to clients who maybe couldn't access them enough. You give them this kind of abstract parallel that can run alongside it. And I think for me, at least at one time, movies was that. Yeah. So I knew if I was feeling, you know, glad I would reach for this movie. If Mm -hmm. I, you know, was feeling sad, but I couldn't quite bring my sad out, I would reach for this movie, you know, and Mm -hmm. I think this, this could be, and, and really with this movie, you know, you said at the beginning, sadness and inspiration. Mm -hmm. I think this movie is a great example of true sadness because you have elements of joy and grief built in together in the sadness of this movie, because you see, you know, Tim, um, cherishing and honoring Uh, and enjoying and taking in his relationship with his dad and his wife. Mm -hmm. And then even after his father passes away, you know, and I was saying this to a client uh, a couple of weeks ago, you know, in his grief, what he actually does is he kind of holds the relationship with his dad up in an honor position rather than I think sometimes in our attempts to grief, we want to lock something away and not look at it. We want to hide it because it's scary to engage in the sadness and the grief. But what he does, I think is true grief in that he, he, he engages the memories. He engages what his dad meant to him. You know, he engages that longing he has for his dad. And then in a very real way in that last scene where they're, you know, playing in his dad's for that walk. And his dad says, this is the last time, isn't he? He's like, yeah, the kid's almost here. This is the last time I can do this. He lets it go. Not, not banishes it away, right? but he lets go um, of his control over, mm-hmm. you know, the memories of his dad. Um, yeah, right. And it's just, it is just the best. I know. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in a very real, th- real way, thank you. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering, you know, we've talked a lot about you know, what you learned in your own journey to get to therapy in, in the career counseling realm. We've talked a lot about kind of what you learned in school and, yeah. and a little bit about what we've learned from the movie. I'm wondering, what's something that you've learned from your clients in your work? So I've learned something about the human spirit. And this, I don't... I, I don't know why, I don't know why I'm surprised, but I am constantly surprised by the human spirit. And what I mean by that is when I see and hear the most awful circumstances, histories, realities of people, um, and I can't actually like relate to it, right? I can 
hold it. I can be curious. I can be open, but I have no framework for it because that's not my story. Mm -hmm. And so I just am with people in this process of therapy and we get to these places where they do uh, miracles. It's like this miracle happens before my eyes and it surprises me. And so I just, that's what I've learned is that, is to never ever like make any hypothesis. To never, I've learned to just be there and and let yourself be surprised. Yeah. And I mean that, like it happens again and again and again and again. And it's always surprising to me. It always blows me away. It's like I would have never imagined that. Well, I mean, I think it certainly speaks to that. And the movie shows this again really well, that benefit of being truly present with people yeah. in the moment. Right. And the gift. I mean, talk about a bad dad joke, but like the gift that the present can be. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you can allow yourself to be, to really be there. Yeah. And I, I think I've said on the show before, um, I actually used to say about myself that I was a time traveler because for me, it was always about living, uh, in the regret of past decisions or living in the worry of future possibilities uh -huh. so much so that I was never in any moment sure. that I was ever, uh, in mm -hmm. and you know, to, to be able to do work where, and a lot of that was being comfortable with, with my own heart, being engaged with it, but to do work where I was actually able to engage with my heart and be truly present with a person yeah. has been the most transformative thing of my life. And so for you to say, you know, to, to, to be in awe of the miracle that can happen in a session when yeah. you can remove any presuppositions or hypotheses or anything from, from your interior to be present with them and, and allow them to do the work and arrive at it. You know, that's, that's not a, a small thing and it's not a shocking thing because that is, that's life. Right. Right. And you know, I think that as you learn the craft, so to speak, um, it, it's natural to, because you're having to filter so much through what you're learning that there, you actually can't be present. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and yet the process still works. You don't have to be a seasoned therapist for the process to work. Yeah. Um, however, as a seasoned therapist, you would think that I would be like, well, I've seen this and this is how it's going to go. And that's just not true. I just never know. In my part-time job that I just left last month, we called that template matching. You've been in it long enough to where you have a lot of experience. Yeah. And when somebody sits in front of you and you hear a problem that is the same or similar to a problem you've encountered before, sure. you don't ever want to jump straight to, well, this is exactly how we're going to solve it. Uh, yeah. I think it's especially true what we do because every person is a, I mean, you know, if you want to go back to Henry, what Henry David Thoreau said, I am large, I contain multitudes. You know, every person has universes inside of themselves uh -huh. based upon where they've come from. And so even if it is the same problem, yes. you know, well, you know, uh, he cheated. Yeah. Because of the different worlds within each person, the same solution may not apply. Right. You know, right. it may need to be a different type of solution because these are different people. Yeah. And I think it's this kind of difficult balance that therapists walk because we do have frameworks mm -hmm. that are helpful, mm -hmm. right? We have research. We have um, really great evidence-based practice that we have to walk in and use to do that without and still maintain this openness and curiosity. So we have like we have a, a map that we're using, um, but the map doesn't keep us from being yeah. there. 
that it's was just a, very hard. That was an, uh, an epiphany that I had late in my internship was with the number one tool of a therapist is a therapeutic relationship. Then that means even if I'm in the room and I'm running through the catalog of what interventions is in this modality and what question to ask next, mm-hmm. if I don't know what to do, being truly present and engaged with somebody is what to do. That's enough. Right. And all of that other stuff can be used in conjunction. But if I'm not getting that relationship right, then it doesn't matter right. what's on the map, what's right. in the tool bag. None of that matters if they don't feel like I'm with them. Yeah. So I've got to concentrate on that first. And then I can pull in anything else. Yeah. Um, so let's say that somebody was listening to our conversation today and they just felt like they could really connect with you and they would love to come see you as a client. How mm-hmm. can they get a hold of you? So, hi, person who's listening. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have just started, launched a group practice. And so my website is different than what it used to be. And it is now Red Therapy Group. Oh, I see what you did there. <laughs> <laughs> And red is not just because of the color of my hair. Um, I see red as the color of change. And so usually, you know, you think about a stop sign that says stop. Well, a lot of times when something is a problem and we want it to stop, that's when we come in for therapy. Yeah. And it, it, it's where change starts. Or you could even, you know, red oftentimes is associated the color of passion. Yes. And then passion, you know, if we look at the, voice of the heart spiritual root system passion is the gift of anger it's the emotion that drives us to change yeah exactly yeah so red therapy group you can go to that site and find out pretty much everything you need as far as how to get started perfect yeah um now you mentioned before we started recording that you've actually got a unique opportunity for our listeners that i I would love to have have to get my notes up yeah um so I am offering a Creative for Connection weekend for therapists, ministry leaders, and their partners. And this will happen quarterly, but right now I'm in the kind of launching stage. And so my next one is in November, beginning of November, and it is local, meaning Franklin, probably Franklin. Middle Tennessee. Um, They could probably come in for it if they wanted. Say that again. Middle Tennessee. Yeah, Middle Tennessee. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's good. That's a catch-all. But if somebody wants to fly in, they can fly in. Well, actually, that happens every year. We've got couples from all over that come. Um, we had Indiana folks, jo- Georgia folks, last just this last one. Oh, wow. So, yeah, you, anybody, obviously, is welcome. You don't have to be local. But the discount code, um, 10% off, if you register with this discount code and you will have had to have listened to this amazing podcast to get it. I'm not sharing it anywhere else or printing it anywhere else. It is T T as in therapist theater (laughs) (laughs) C four C the letter C the number four and the letter C as in created for connection. Yeah. And Created for Connection, um, a a book that came out a few years ago, Sue Johnson, the founder of uh, EFT, and Kenny Sandifer, who is... um, Amazing. He's my uh, mentor. Yeah. Um, He's kind of like our local Sue Johnson. Yeah. he's, he's He's the guy that put Nashville, Middle Tennessee, really Tennessee on the EFT map. Wow. He really is. And probably one of my favorite stories of all time, as before he was an EFT guru, he was a rodeo clown. (laughs) Actually, I asked him, he wasn't a clown. I know. The story has got, it might have been me that got the story wrong and like it spread, but he was a rodeo bull rider. Oh. Yes. That's even cooler. I know. <laughs> so I'm so glad that I got that straight with him recently. Yeah. I mean, I'm pretty sure 
I thought I heard that at the externship. So, and he was there. So maybe, maybe I heard that. I just had a conversation with yeah. him recently and I was like, That's yeah, great. cause you were a rodeo clown. He was like, I mean, I am funny, but no. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, well, thank you so much for sharing that, um, that code. Uh, so certainly, you know, if you're listening to this and not only, you know, did you feel like you could connect with Kelly, but maybe if you're a therapist or a ministry leader or somebody who works with people and you would like to maybe invest in your relationship a little bit using EFT, using some of the things we've talked about today, uh, then the created for connection weekend intensive, I don't know what you would. Yeah, it's two days, um, either a Friday, Saturday or Saturday, Sunday. And it is for, it's like, we go through the curriculum of Created mm-hmm. for Connection, so the book loosely. Um, and it's just a bunch of couples together. It's great because you have that group feel. There's some teaching. Um, and then there's a practical element where you break out and have conversations um, on your own privately. Yeah, that, that'll be a great chance for you to invest in, uh, in your relationship. And thanks to Kelly, you can get 10% off. Yay. to do it. So thank you so much for, for coming on and this being a guest. This has been really fun. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. Well, I can't wait to have you back again. Okay, let's thank do you. it. Hi, my love. Hey there. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Someone has <laughs> been sick the past few mm-hmm. days with some sniffles and... Uh, was it Thursday that you lost your voice? Yeah, Thursday at like when I woke up, I was fine. And then at, at around three o'clock that day, I noticed. And then by like I noticed my voice was going hoarse. And then by five o'clock, my voice was completely gone. Yeah. It happened very quickly. Yeah. And so as a, as a uh, well, a temporary remedy for that, like I, I downloaded on <laughs> your phone an app that you can type and it will speak whatever you type and has different accents and such. And do you want me to use that for the episode? Oh, that would be clever. I was going to just say that you didn't you didn't take advantage of that. And I think it would have been just a big benefit because you could have chosen an accent <laughs> uh, to maybe even match your mood. Well, maybe next time. Or I can do it right now for the podcast. Yeah. It'll just take a long time. That's true. But we can edit all the blank spaces out. So yeah. It'll be just as if my co-host is a robot. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to? No, no. Okay. <laughs> See, fine. you'd rather talk to me than a robot. Well, obviously, yeah. <laughs> I just think it would be funny. Um, so we're recording this episode, or I should say, we're recording this wrap up a little earlier in the week than we normally do. Yeah. Um, you've got a business trip coming. Up. <laughs> um, yeah, it sounds sounds very fancy when you say well, it like that. You're you're a fancy business lady. <laughs> Should we have gone to the Lady Blazer store to get you a Lady Blazer for this business trip? I'm actually bringing the only Lady Blazer that I have, although I don't know if I'll wear it because I think... I was unaware you had a Lady Blazer. Yeah, I got it for Christmas. Oh my gosh, you're right. Yeah. I remember the Lady Blazer now. Yeah. I'm bringing it with me just in case I'm feeling really, you know, businessy. Yeah. But I highly doubt that I'll wear it. But I wanted to have it just in case. Absolutely. It's one of those things that I think I... I, if I wear it, I'll probably feel like, you know, more confident and stuff. Yes. Like if you wear the wardrobe for the job that you want, you'll like act like yeah. you're in that job. Kind or of thing. it's like Thor with Mjolnir. <laughs> like when you put the lady blazer on, if you're worthy, you will have, you will be have able the power to put it on. <laughs> you'll have the power of a business lady. Oh, wow. Yeah. Unstoppable power. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we'll see. I'll update everybody <laughs> next week on if I actually wore it. Um, originally, I was going to say it's like He-Man with his sword, but I thought that Thor would be more current reference. Yeah. Yeah. Are you familiar with He-Man? You've told me about He-Man and She-Ra. Okay. I was going to say if you're familiar with She-Ra, but you haven't engaged in their no. entertaining. I only know of it because of you. Okay. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll remedy that. Um, it's another 80s cartoon that when you were a kid in the 80s watching it it was awesome and when you go back and watch it you're like oh this is this is not good <laughs> and i think those the, are the best yeah i think the only 
cartoon. I'm going to say two cartoons that as a kid were great and as an adult are great are DuckTales. Mm-hmm. No, I'm going to add on. Sorry. I'm going to name off a couple. Here we go. Rapid fire lightning round. One, two, three, go. DuckTales, Batman, the animated series, Chippendale Rescue Rangers, Ooh, yes. Tailspin. Gargoyles? Gargoyles. Oh, yeah. That's it. <laughs> Nothing else makes the list. Really? I could probably think of some things, but it's okay. Okay, rapid fire. Three, two, one, go. I don't know. Scooby-Doo? Nope. Power Rangers? Not a cartoon. Oh, no. They turned into a TV show like way later. You're right. Uh, what? No, Power Rangers started as a TV show. Listen. And on top of that, it started as a Japanese TV show that an American company just bought the footage from. And so they filmed new footage of the people outside of the costumes. And when it came time to get in the costumes, they played the old Japanese footage. Wow. I've learned so much already this week. That's true. (laughs) And also, Scooby-Doo doesn't really hold up. Have you watched it lately? I'm not I saying it wasn't awesome as a kid. I can't remember the last time that I watched it, but I will never. It's Scooby Doo is great. No, no, but and I've I, watched the movies. Right. Also, not cartoons. I know. What I'm saying is those are terrible. These, this, the overlap that we're talking about in the Venn diagram is it was awesome when you were a kid. I know, and I think Scooby Doo counts. Listen, I'll watch Scooby Doo and then we'll revisit this. Listeners, here's but what I, I want you to do. I saying. want you to at us on Twitter. Tweet at us at Therapist Theater. Let us know what cartoons did you love as a kid and hold up to you as an adult. The old SpongeBob. Is there a new SpongeBob? Yes. I think it's like anything past or like around 2000 is terrible. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for accepting that. (laughs) Okay. I never watched SpongeBob. I... It missed me. Yeah, I know. But I, I, the only times that I've watched it was, late it 90s thing. was when I was like babysitting a buddy's kids. Mm-hmm. And I did enjoy it. So, yeah, yeah. It's funny. I'll keep thinking. Okay. As, as the week goes on, I'll just text you random cartoons that I think of that are so good. Boom. Love it. <laughs> or you could, you could at Therapist Theater on Twitter. Well, you're my husband. So it's that's a true. But weird. what, Leanne, your fans <laughs> want to know what you think. <laughs> <laughs> that's a hundred percent true they do well we'll update them next yeah. week Ooh, we need to think of a name for your fans leaniacs absolutely not no okay all right i'll put it i'll put it on the back burner <laughs> we'll let it simmer you'll come back we'll have an entire fan club formed we'll all have t-shirts <laughs> okay it'll be great I can't you can wait. sponsor the fan club on patreon so Big time business lady. Yes, that is I. Tell me what you thought of About Time and tell me what you thought oh. of uh, my conversation with Kelly. Oh my gosh. About Time. What a time to be alive. Yeah, it's about time we watched that it movie. It really is. <laughs> I th- I am one of the people who like didn't even know. I didn't know that movie existed really until we watched it. And then I told a coworker like the day after. I was like, oh, you need to go watch this movie immediately. And then like four days later, she came back in and like a meeting or something and was like, oh, you guys, we watched this movie last night. It's called About Time. And I wanted to be like, are you kidding me? I just told you to watch that. <laughs> Anyways, um, it is so good. At the end of this, when you ask me if it's a buy, rent or pass, I will absolutely say bye. Spoilers. Yeah. Well, it's it's really, really good. Yeah. Highly encourage anybody who hasn't seen it to go watch it. Yeah. Which at this point, if you're this <clears throat> deep into the podcast and you haven't seen it. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah. Go watch it. Um, yeah. I mean, I just I the movie was just so beautiful. I I found myself. Um, so you talked about me crying. I don't think I really cried until the end. And even then I just kind of teared up a little bit. But it's not because it's not worth crying. Like if we watch it again, I will one hundred percent cry through probably. Well, I half cried of the more movie. than you. You did, which is this is an unusual. That's an unusual scenario. I know. Not that I don't cry. I tear up at a ton of things. <laughs> but like for instance, cry. like for instance, at an episode of American Ninja Warrior this morning, I teared up. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, like full on cry. Yeah. That's more rare for you, I'd say, than it is for me. Yeah. But this, but here's why. So this is what I was going to say. 
I didn't have any idea what this movie was about when mm. we started watching it. Um, and with the time travel thing, when it started and when he was first meeting his wife, I kept waiting for like a big conflict to happen with them. That's what I, I was like waiting and waiting and waiting. Like when he um, saw his ex-girlfriend or whatever, or not his ex-girlfriend, but the girl that he had loved over that summer and then like ended up, he like almost went to her apartment and then left. I just kept waiting for something to come back and bite him in the butt as far as like him traveling back and forth. Like the fact that he traveled back and made sure to go and meet her, you know, whatever. I think there for, I don't know why, but I thought the movie was about the two of them. And so I just thought, Oh, like something's going to happen where she's mm -hmm. going to find out or whatever. And it never did. So I think that that's why it, I didn't cry as much is because I was sort of like, mentally waiting for this other storyline to happen yeah. and then suddenly before my eyes a whole like completely different storyline was unfolding yeah well i mean i think that what what happened at least with us watching it and i would imagine most people if you haven't seen the movie yet is the rare thing of not knowing anything about a movie before you go in mm -hmm. like the only thing i knew is i remember seeing the trailer when it came out yeah, I didn't and even that know it that. was like the dad explaining to the kid, hey, all the guys in our family can time travel. And the kid being like, shut up. And him being like, no, no, for real. And like, that's it. Mm -hmm. I didn't know anything else about the movie. And so it was just a really cool sitting down watching a movie and having no idea. Yeah. Like, no idea. Like, even with the Marvel movies that come out right now, I'm such a Marvel nerd. Yeah. I've read all the comics. So, like, I have a general idea. I mean, because, you know, they mm -hmm. change some things, but I have a general idea of what to expect and what to happen. But, mm -hmm. like, with this... No e idea. So even if I don't check out spoilers, which I usually do, like, but with this, there's just, you know, it was just such a, a beautiful surprise. Yeah, it was. So, anyways, that's what I thought about the movie. It was great. And then um, listening to you and Kelly was great. I really want to visit her office one day and witness it because it sounds... Sounds great. Um, I also really like, I thought, I thought she was a great example of a person who didn't get into therapy by going through therapy themselves. Cause you and, and several guests have talked about that and have kind of gotten onto that subject. And you've always said that like, it's tough for you to imagine getting into therapy without having gone through therapy. Mm -hmm. And I think I've always sort of identified with people who haven't, because and social work is different but it's still you know it's a helping profession and um i i remember f like truly a google search which i think kelly actually said something about you know you can't necessarily google and find your you know where you should be but i i really did google <laughs> what's the did you use the i'm feeling lucky button no i okay. typed in something to the effect of what's the closest thing to early childhood education that's not early childhood education <laughs> that would help me graduate fastest. That's a long I, search. <laughs> I know. I don't remember what combination of words I use, but that's what I was looking for. Like what's a major that's not this, but it's enough this that I already have enough credits that I won't have to graduate too late. And through that, I found social work. It, I still had to go an extra year, so it, it didn't it, work out. It kids. sounds like Google was your academic advisor. Yeah. <laughs> Millennials. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I, but Hashtag all this. Hashtag avocado toast. I'll go into the story more at another point, but it, I just, I just identified with her in that way, like that she found something and then she talked about like, as she took the classes, it just was confirmed over and over again. And I had that kind of experience. And so I think, um, it was just cool to hear. It was a, it was a, it was a good, um, unique example of yeah. somebody who got into it because they truly just had this passion. And it was like, it's all, it sounds like, um, you know, this is paraphrasing of course, but it's, it just sounds like it was something that she felt like, Oh my gosh. Yeah. This is built into me. Like this is what it is. Yeah. And I'll, I'll say, I, you know, just to recognize what my own biases are. I mean, I think I really did have a bias against therapists who had not gone through therapy, just mm. thinking how on earth could you know how to do this if you hadn't received it as well. And uh, Kelly's just somebody who's so authentic and genuine. And I just felt in our, our short time together, um, 
was able to connect with Mm -hmm. that I I, I think, you know, she just completely changed my mind. Mm. And and I think that's the case for most things. Like it's just to have one template that you think everybody has to fit into is just not, um, realistic. It's not realistic anymore. Not even anymore. I mean, uh, it's just not realistic. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And she had some really cool thoughts about even how that sort of maybe have maybe benefited her like going through oh she talked about being a blank without, slate as yeah she went, yeah so i just i that was really cool to hear i loved hearing about how she got into it and it was fascinating and interesting and and cool yeah um yeah so and then she also said something about so she works she talked about how you know that's how she got into therapy and then she went to that externship that kenny had told her you know, to go to or encourage yeah. her to go to, to get people there. Yeah. Which I thought was really funny. Um, which I have been to as well. Yeah, I know. Um, although I can't remember the year that I went though. Sometime I think it was Christmas of 15. It was either Christmas of 15 or 16. 16. I think. Were you in town? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, I don't remember anyways. Yeah. Um, but I, she talked about how she got into attachment and then at some point you asked her like about, the work that she does in the room like with clients and I forgot the exact question, but her answer was that everything feels kind of similar no matter what the presenting issue is because she works in attachment. And I, I really honed in on that and just, I, for, I don't know. I think for whatever reason, I just wanted to highlight that she said that because I think it does just show that so many of our, conflicts in life and like our you know the things that we get emotional about and the things that really trigger like you know big responses in us um and things that tend to be presenting issues you know that would make you go to therapy it all so much of it comes back to attachment wounds whether that's from you know your parents or from significant others or from friends like it I just think that's crazy like it it just sounds like no matter what the presenting issue is it's the same kind of work because you're working in the language of relationships Mm -hmm. and attachment, which everybody. Yeah. I don't know. I think I just wanted to point that out as like, Hey, you guys, it doesn't matter. Like it all comes down to these things and it's worth exploring. Yeah. I think it's interesting because anybody that I know who works in attachment, myself included, (laughs) I always hear them talk about it as something along the lines of one day it being presented to them Hmm. and like a light coming on, like everything seeming like it makes sense. And as I, as I look back over like the, a, the personal work that I did as a client, B, my education and C, the work that I do as a therapist, um, I realize that, it was something I had no concept of before my education, mm-hmm. even in my therapy as a client. Oh, interesting. I can look back and see it. I can see my therapists doing that as work, but they never once said attachment or attachment theory or anything like that. And huh. so I, I didn't have a word that I could have said, this is what's going on. And, and in my work as a therapist what I see with my clients is something similar to Kelly there are a lot of attachment things that come up no matter what the work is now I would say that's probably not true if you're working with clients who are pathological if you work with like personality disorders or something but yeah in the con in the realm of relationships Mm -hmm. I think it's all going to come back to attachment um I mean there's even been things as you and I have walked the dog that I've been processing with you where I've realized I've got this thing going on in the present, but Oh my gosh, it ties to this Mm -hmm. thing back in the past. And you know, I'm experiencing what, what would be like my therapist used to call it a compound emotion, but um, Peter Scazzaro called it an emotional allergic reaction Mm -hmm. where like just something in the present is tied to something in the past. And, the reaction is proportionately bigger yeah. in the present than what it is reacting to. Uh-huh. And that's because it triggers this thing from the past and everything from the past stacks on top of the thing in the present. Yeah. Um, 
And so, I mean, yeah, attachment is, is just this in- incredible thing. Mm-hmm. And I think it's also something that if you lean into it, helps you to be just to be, to be present with a client hmm. so that you don't have to get into the weeds of all this other stuff. You just kind of have to lean in whenever you kind of see the pain and, yeah. and begin to kind of ask and ask and reflect and reflect. And Yeah. That's something that I have, I think has been really powerful to me recently is realizing that I have a lot of different interests in the realm of like my profession. Like there's a lot of different populations that I could see myself working with eventually and like at some point um I think the the thing that ties them all together though is how powerful relationships are like mm-hmm. mentoring is what I'm in right now and f- holy cow like if there's anything that should be informed by attachment theory it you know it should be having like a stable adult in a child's life there to mentor them anyways but I yeah I just um I forgot how we got on that subject <laughs> Oh, you were just saying how Kelly oh, attachment. in her yeah, work, yeah. attachment shows up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you did remind me of something else that I wanted to say when you were talking about the work that you've done. So you mentioned in this podcast, the notebook of all the stuff from that group that you went through that you wrote, you like wrote down all the different exercises and like questions and whatever. And, um, that's something that you and I have looked at together at different points. Like if something has come up and to help me understand like where you're coming from, you know, we've looked at different exercises in there and, or like things that you've completed. And it just, I think I just wanted to say that because it has helped me. It's helped me understand you so much and it helps me understand where you come from. And it's because you did all this work before we got together of understanding where you come from, you know, and like walking through your whole life and realizing all the ways that like, you might have been hurt and how that affects you in your present. And that just has helped our relationship so much. So this is just a plug. <laughs> if, if, if a person for, listening for to Josh's this, notebook, <laughs> no, it's not a plug for your notebook. It's a plug for therapy. Like, I mean, this is, it's a therapist theater podcast. So I don't know, maybe there's people who listen to this who like aren't, you know, familiar with therapy, but like it just how much it has helped our relationship for both of us to have done you know work to to familiarize ourselves with our own story so like the thing that I I remember that I wrote down was like the more you know yourself the more of yourself you can share with someone else yeah 100 percent. yeah so I when you talked about that that's just that's what it made me think of and I I thought I would just want to say that like how how crazy helpful that it has been for you to know yourself in our relationship yeah and you said a second ago you don't know if anybody would be listening to this that wasn't familiar with therapy. Like <laughs> I, I genuinely hope that there is. That's that yeah. was the actual mission of the podcast is for f- to provide something for people who are unfamiliar or doubtful of mental health mm-hmm. or are just seeking some kind of truth about relationships to provide a common ground where we have a framework, we have a language that anybody can speak through through yeah. movies and TV and pop culture and um, so I hope that that mm. there are people out there that don't know anything about it and I, and I hope again that through the podcast they would learn something about it and that if therapy is something that they are thinking of pursuing I I would just encourage you to take that next step towards it because it yeah. is it is something that has helped me tremendously and hopefully, the therapy that I am providing is, is helping others. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, so this is more about like the movie, but when you guys were talking about how he went back to change his sister's accident, but then realized his kid was different. And so then he like went back and unchanged it, I guess. Um, and then what that ended up kind of leading to was you guys talking about, you, you said specifically things that hurt become a part of your story, which I love. And I thought this movie was such a good example of how sometimes there's crappy things that happen in your life and it's painful and it's not the kind of thing that you would wish on anyone. And it's not the kind of thing that you would want to go back and go through again. But at the end of the day, it gets you to where you are currently. And like, the more that you can learn from that stuff and the more that you can learn about yourself from that stuff, it just, 
I think it makes your present so much more full and I don't know, just satisfying and, um, you can be more content, I think in your present, if you have really explored the stuff that's gone on in your past and like, if you really accept it, um, yeah. I don't, know, I don't know if you truly can be content in the present unless you've done that. Yeah, I would agree. I think you can be happy. Uh huh. Because happy has to do so much with circumstance. And so if your circumstances are better, I, to me, contentment, though, there's this element of peace to it. Yeah. Um, and I think peace can only come through acceptance. And, and I think like not regretting. I think acceptance can only come through exploring where you've been. Yeah. I really like that. I agree. But uh, yeah, I just thought this movie was such a such a perfect example of that like yeah. there were bad things that happened you know but he didn't he realized that to keep what he had that day he had you know in the present he mm-hmm. couldn't change those or couldn't like protect like in that case he couldn't protect his sister from experiencing something bad and the fact that she experienced it and then it and then like she ended up getting into a better relationship and like being more happy you know, that made her all the more stronger. So, well, it reminds me of the eternal sunshine of the spotless mind episode where, you know, I I think it was you that pointed out, like it was them finally, um, engaging in their hurt that Mm -hmm. allowed them to change and to heal their relationship, or at least, I mean, we don't know if it was totally healed, but at least give them a chance. And so it's another example of that, of, there are times where running from the hurt is going to cause more hurt. Yes. Because if you don't take it in, if you don't truly feel it, Mm -hmm. then you can't move forward into healing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's an interesting thing to, to think about, you know, if there's anybody who hasn't done that, like, or I I know, I know for me that I have had times where I've really thought, yeah, I wish I could have, if I, if I could go back, I wouldn't want that to happen again, or I wouldn't want to go through that again. But, you know, like as, especially as you and I have gotten together and started kind of building our life, I, I just would never say that anymore because there are so many things I was going through things when you met me, Mm -hmm. like I wouldn't be where I am right now. If I, if some of the, you know, situations I was in, if those didn't happen. So like it just, yeah, I think this is a great movie to cause you to kind of reflect on that. And if you are someone who like wishes that you could do something differently or take something away as part of your past, just think about the, think about who you would be if that didn't happen and, and really like appreciate what you've been through and the strength that it yeah. has given you. And, and I want to, it, it's not that I don't think the point of the movie was you're not allowed to look back and think, Oh, I, I wish I could have made a different choice or I think I would make a different choice today if I had the chance again. It's a matter of accepting what has come mm-hmm. and truly pursuing understanding it. Yeah. Um, so that you can walk forward and into health and into healing. Yeah. Um, but it's not necessarily... Yeah, I just I, I just want to caution people. I, I don't want anybody to hear what we're saying and begin to self shame themselves. No, 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 no. I don't mean that at all. I just I just meant like the hard stuff that you've been through, appreciate what that's given you. Like it's given you strength and if you're if you're still here today, then like you've made it through stuff. Everybody's yeah. made it through stuff. Absolutely. And how beautiful that is. That's one of my favorite things to do with clients is to highlight strength and resilience Hmm. because a lot of times they will be saying I don't know if I can do this when Mm -hmm. there are times and examples in their lives of exceptional outcomes when they already have yeah and I love pointing those out Mm -hmm. and just saying are you kidding me you've already done this you you've already shown your metal you've already shown the strength inside of you Mm -hmm. and so you don't have to wonder can you do it you have done it you are currently doing it yeah you've done that for me sometimes it's very powerful. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a very powerful person. <laughs> I don't. You are. I don't have a lady blazer to prove it, <laughs> but <laughs> we can get you one if you want. That's all. That's all. Yeah. Wow. So, <clears throat> my love. Yes. Uh, buy rent or pass. Oh, buy for sure. Yeah. It's such a good movie, you guys. Go watch it. Or if it's on Netflix. Yeah. If you're still on the fence, it is on Netflix. 
for you to check out yeah. for free. And then buy and it. And then buy it. Absolutely. A hundred percent. Um, and on top of that, the soundtrack is great. Yeah, it is. And that is officially You've been playing that that um Ben Fold song on repeat since Yeah. Since then. Well it was like a rediscovery. I it was know. just such a powerful because it was this song that had been in my world like ten or twelve or fifteen years before. It was a very powerful moment. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, that's it. That's all we got. Thanks for joining us, Boom. everyone. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for coming into the theater with your lady blazers on <laughs> and just being the powerful people that you are. Yeah. Strong, independent, powerful women. And stylish. And, and people. Yeah. So for this week, we're going to raise the lights, lower the curtain, and say the theater is closed.